Hi, I'm Sam Pollard, director of MLK FBI. Violence is self-defeating. He who lives by the sword will perish by the sword. You know, when you construct a man as a great man, there's nothing almost more satisfying than also seeing him as the opposite. When the National Archive puts government documents up on the web, one has to confront them. Tapes from the hotel rooms, FBI reports, those are pieces of information that we shouldn't have. The FBI was most alarmed about King because of his success. He realized how sick this country was. We were trying to reveal the truth about segregation. J. Edgar Hoover is famous for saying that he feared the rise of a black messiah. The FBI says it's clear Martin Luther King Jr. is the most dangerous Negro in America, and we have to use every resource at our disposal to destroy him. J. Edgar Hoover was the head of the FBI for 48 years. The FBI's focus was collecting salacious sexual material of King with various girlfriends. Hoover had made the speech that Martin Luther King was the world's most notorious liar. Now, what am I going to do about Martin Luther King? It looks to me like he's too far north. This was a way that they could bring down a very influential black civil rights leader and contain the movement. The FBI mailed the tape of Dr. King with other women to him and to Coretta with an advice that he should go kill himself. The greatness of America is the right to protest far right. Staying calm under fire is very hard when people are trying to kill you. Anybody who was to the left of mainstream in civil rights was deemed a subversive. They use surveillance in order to foment violence and break apart these organizations. They were running the surveillance state. This represents the darkest part of the Bureau's history. That is the trailer for the documentary MLK FBI, and this is Factual America. We're brought to you by Alamo Pictures, a London-based production company making documentaries about America for international audiences. Today we're talking about Martin Luther King Jr. and specifically the surveillance and harassment of the civil rights leader by the U.S. government. Helping us to learn more about this dark chapter in America's history is award-winning director and producer Sam Pollard. Uh, Sam, welcome to Factual America. Uh, how are things with you? Uh, things are pretty good, you know, depending, you know, be, you know, we're dealing with the COVID in America, like every place else in the world. Yeah. But uh, I've been uh, keeping safe and distance from people and try not to interact too much. Yeah. Things have been fine. Oh, great. That's good to hear. Um, very similar here. We've just gone into a national lockdown. I'm, we're based here in, in the UK and... Uh, yeah, as you say, it's the great, in many ways, the great equalizer. Um, uh, so, uh, I mean, you have an amazing filmography, to say the least, but uh, the film we're here to talk about is uh, MLK FBI. Uh, it's, well, this, we're recording this on the 5th of January, but it's, uh, this will be, uh, this podcast will be released on the 19th. And that by that time, your film will have been released, uh, theatrical release, I guess, on the 15th. And will it be also streaming? Absolutely. I think that the uh, IFC is planned to do virtual screenings around the country in the United States, and I know that it's going to be released in the UK the same day. Okay, excellent. Uh, well, thanks again for coming on. It's an, it's an honor to have you, and thanks for making this film, which uh, one of the great perks of this the job I've got is I get to see these things before they come out. And um, I mean, if, if you don't mind, uh, for our listeners, Maybe you can give us a little uh, synopsis of what MLK FBI is about. Uh, MLK FBI is a documentary that looks at uh, the uh, high point of Dr. King's career in America from the 60s up to his assassination in 1968, April 4th, 1968, and how as he was trying to break the ball backs of segregation in America, he was constantly being surveilled and monitored by J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. He was wiretapped. You know, he was 
you know, watched, he had informants in his organization, you know, they were constantly trying to figure out how to discredit Dr. King and his reputation. So this documentary looks at both who King was, what he was having to confront and deal with on a daily basis with the FBI, and also at the same time giving you an understanding of the trajectory of the history of the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover. Okay, excellent. Well, I think we're, we're going to talk a little bit about all these things in a little more detail here shortly. Um, so basically, this, this surveillance, which I guess many of us have been aware of, but which you now document very, very well for us, is it has its roots in the Red Scare, doesn't it, of, of the 50s? Absolutely. Yeah. We come out of World War II. America had just defeated Germany and Japan and Italy. And, you know, and we had had a relationship during the war with the Soviet Union, uh, led by Joseph Stalin. And then all of a sudden in the late 40s, the notion of communism became the next sort of red herring in American history, where everybody looked around the corner and said, if you were a communist, you were trying to destroy the fabric of American democracy. And one of the strongest proponents of trying to destroy communism in America was the mm -hmm. FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover. He yeah. was obsessed with the Communist Party. And so he was looking to find anyone who might have been connected, like the Rosenbergs, you know, like Robert Oppenheim, anybody who was connected with the Communist Party and trying to make sure that they didn't infiltrate or destroy America. And so what happened in the 50s, when Dr. King became a leader of the civil rights movement with the Montgomery bus boycott and developed a relationship in the late 50s, early 60s with a gentleman named Stanley Levinson, who had been a former member of the Communist Party, that immediately raised the hackles on J. Edgar Hoover's neck to say, mm -hmm. uh-oh, here's this civil rights leader, Martin Luther King, this Negro, who's in conversation and having meetings with a communist, a former communist, Stanley Levinson. And his feeling was that, that they were trying, the Communist Party was trying to co-opt Dr. King and the civil rights movement. And it had always been the concern that African-Americans who were unhappy with segregation in America were, you know, were being approached by members of the Communist Party as early as the 1930s. Yeah. And I think you've got a great uh, archival footage there of uh, Dr. King saying what's, what he finds the most remarkable is that more African-Americans hadn't become communists. Members of the Communist Party. Very yeah. upfront about it. Absolutely yeah. right. You know, because for many who thought the Communist Party was a way to sort of deal with segregation, it became something that was attractive. Yeah. And so, I mean, it, it's to the point that even um, uh, John F. Kennedy and his brother, Robert Kennedy, the Attorney General, even tell him, tell uh, Dr. King to cool it, to, to stop these associations with Stanley Levinson, Levinson don't they? Yeah, because J. Edgar, J., J. Edgar Hoover had gotten Bobby Kennedy to approve the wiretapping, the monitoring of Dr. King because of his so-called connections with Stanley Levinson. And when that information was brought to the Kennedys, right before the March in Washington, King went to the White House and met with John Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy, who told him, you know, in no uncertain terms, that he needed to distance himself from Stanley Levinson and anybody who was in his organization who had any connections with the Communist Party. Now, the reality of it was that Dr. King said to these gentlemen, the President of the United States and the Attorney General, that he was going to sever his ties with Stanley Levinson and other members in his organization who had communist affiliations or, or previous communist ties. But in reality, he didn't. He didn't separate himself or distance himself from Stanley Levinson, even though he did with some other people. You know, but he told these gentlemen that he was. But he continued to have Stanley Levinson as a very close confidant. Yeah. And then, so this, as, as you've already said, I mean, this, for J. Edgar Hoover, this was a way of justifying wiretaps and um, bugging hotel rooms and these sort of things. Even as, even if uh, Dr. King's speechwriter, uh, Clarence Jones's house is fully wiretapped, you know. Exactly. So you document that very well in the film. Um, and then what they... How best to put it? They stumble upon things about <laughs> um, Dr. King's extra, you know, of his personal life, and this kind of takes on a, a a whole different form of of I don't know. It, it takes a it takes a turn basically. 
takes a deep turn, yeah. Matthew. I mean, all of a sudden, here they're listening, they're wiretapping Dr. King, they're eavesdropping on his conversations yeah. and on what happened, what's happening in these hotel rooms. And lo, lo, lo and behold, they realized that he was having these extramarital affairs. Yeah. And, for, and for Hoover and one of his right-hand men, William Sullivan, they saw this as an opportunity that they thought could really discredit Dr. King. Not only was he having these, you know, these extramarital affairs, but he was a Christian minister. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, who was basically talking about nonviolent protests from the pulpits of his church, you know, and pulpits of other churches around the country. And here he is having these illicit affairs. They thought that they, they had found the thing that could destroy who they thought was one of the most dangerous Negroes in America, yeah. you know, by releasing this information about Dr. King's illicit affairs. Now, the thing to remember is here we are in the mid 60s where the press at that time did not take the bait. They did not take material that looked at people's deeply personal lives to use mm. in the press. You know, the world has changed radically since then. But back then, yeah, the, the illicit affairs of someone like Dr. King or even John F. Kennedy exactly was not was not op- was not open game. <laughs> you know, that's interesting. I haven't even. I mean, why do you think? What do you think that was, and what? Why has this all changed? Because it's true. I mean, we, uh, if sports figures, name it, whoever was in the public eye, these sort of things, probably a lot of journalists knew things or were given tips, but they just would, as you said, never would take the bait. It was a different world we lived in. I mean, yeah. think about it. It was a world back then where men wore suit and ties, where you know there was a certain <laughs> sort of what I call. American gentility, yeah, <laughs> you know, and so the idea that you were going to spread on the front pages that John Kennedy was involved in Marilyn Monroe or that Dr. King was having these these extramarital affairs was not something they would do, you know. And you've seen how it's 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 flipped 180 degrees since then, yeah. you know. Yeah. Everything is game, but the, but what's fascinating to me though, Matthew, is that even though things now are being published and seen on television about people's personal lives. For some people, it doesn't seem to have much impact. Well, that's Maybe true. We've become so neutered to scandal and stuff that even though you may bring out all the horrific things in the personal life of Donald J. Trump, it doesn't seem to stick. Yeah. Or, yeah, and, and other politicians as well across the globe. It's, it doesn't it, stick anymore. It doesn't stick anymore. People are like, to be honest, it's we've kind of, I guess maybe even become schizophrenic a bit and completely separating the, the two. Absolutely. Uh, and, and behind all this, and we'll, I do have a few more questions about that, but behind all this is one man, as you've already talked about, uh, who's also, it's, uh, it's J. Edgar Hoover, isn't it? And so you, you, the film does a great job of also documenting, as you said, him and the FBI and the agency that he built and became this sort of, um, I don't know, a very uh, venerable institution, if you will, um, in, in the United States. It became an iconic presence in American history. Yeah. Think of it this way, Matthew. Here, am I, here I am as a 13, 14-year-old African-American male in East Harlem yeah. in 1963 and 1964. And my, my remembrance of Jango, who read the time, was like he was a hero. He was a guy who, you know, with his G-men, you know, killed John Dillinger. He was yeah. a guy who was going to keep the country from becoming red, you know. He yeah. was a guy who had these FBI agents with the Tommy guns and stuff. Yeah. I bought into that stuff back in 63, 64. Yeah. I mean, if, as we see in the film, when there was a popularity poll taken of King and Hoover, you know, in the mid-60s, who was more popular? J. Edgar Hoover. Yeah. Than, than, than Martin Luther King. Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons that we put into the film all these old movie clips from films like Walk a Crooked Mile and Big Jim McClain and yeah. the FBI stories, because I knew those films, you know, intimately from watching them on television and understanding that they were used to prop up, you know, the fact that the FBI was this fabulous organization yeah. that was doing good, you know, helping America stay on the right track. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm I'm old enough as a little kid remembering the reruns of of the FBI would always show up, you know, on on right. afternoons when you come home from school, you know. Efren Zemblis uh, Jr. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and the thing is, he, I mean, he was head of the FBI for 48 years. I mean, this guy, 
he just he was a a uh, power unto himself, wasn't he? He was he was a dictator. Yeah, I mean, imagine all the dirt he collected on people through those years. I mean, he could destroy people's lives. Yeah, you know, he had dirt on probably every president mm -hmm. that came through the White House from his beginning as a director up until he retired in the seventies. I mean, for our listeners, you can just you can Google it. I mean, there's always dangers in just Googling things and reading whatever Wikipedia. But uh, there's, you know, plenty of quotes from different presidents who said they wanted to get rid of him but didn't think they could. That's right. Uh, you know, he was a dangerous man. He had he files. Truman wanted to get rid of him. JFK wanted to get rid of him. I mean, they just couldn't do it. Um, but this film is... So in many ways, this film is as much about the FBI or the U.S. government as it is about... MLK, isn't it? I mean, is that why you kind of, it's MLK stroke FBI, you know? Yeah, that's exactly right. We, we yeah. felt that was important to, to show the dichotomy between these two, two men and these two organizations. Yeah. Dr. King, as the head of the civil rights struggle, particularly through the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and J. Edgar Hoover as the executive director of the FBI, you know, and the, and the fact that they were on this collision course yeah. You know, that led to that for only, only, the only meeting they ever had in Washington, D.C. Yeah. And the fact uh, that the FBI only stopped monitoring King because he was assassinated. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, exactly. Um, well, I think what we're going to do is we're going to give our listeners a, uh, an early break, and then we'll be uh, right back with uh, Sam Pollard. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with Sam Pollard, award-winning director and producer and editor of many things, uh, many great films, but as we already discussed, we're talking about MLK FBI. Uh, theatrical release on January 15th, which is uh, Dr. King's birthday and just days before the official holiday that uh, is commemorated for him in the, in the U.S. Um, why make this film now, Sam? Well, I would like to say, honestly to you, Matthew, that I made this film because we knew that it would be it would resonate with the times today. Yeah. yeah. But in all honesty, Ben Hedin and I, the producer of the film, had just finished another wonderful documentary, if I do say so myself, titled Two Trains Running. Right. And uh, we were looking for a new project in 2017. So Ben, who's a real sort of civil rights buff, yeah. just read uh, um, Dave Garrell's book about Dr. King and the FBI. And he sent me a copy. And he said, Sam, I think this is our next film, to take a look at the, the relationship between the FBI and Dr. King. So I read the book and I was very familiar with David Garrow because he had been one of our major consultants when I worked on Eyes on the Prize too. And so I read the book and I, I called Ben, I think two days later, I said, you're absolutely right. This is our next film. This will be, I think a good deep dive because because I'm at this stage in my career where I just don't want to do what I call sort of a survey film about anything or anybody. I want to be able to dig into it like an anthropologist, yeah. an archeologist really and to really look at the pros and cons, the nuances of human beings and, and, and different institutions. So by you know, taking on this film, I felt it was a great opportunity to dig into who Dr. King was, dig into Hoover, dig into the FBI. And so that was really attraction to the project. Now, who knew that 2020 would be <laughs> such a monumental year in, in world history, you know, with the yeah. pandemic, with the deaths of people like Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, and the Black Lives Matter movement taking hold, not only in, in America, but all over the world. Who knew that yeah. our film would be a part of this sort of zeitgeist? So, you know, it's sort of like, uh, it's just uh, two things coming together that we weren't aware would happen. Mm. I mean, I, I had this down as a question to ask you later, but I'll ask it now since we're on it. Uh, I mean, as a documentarian, I would say you're a historian as well. Uh, in what I you would do. Say, I would agree with that. Yeah. I, great. I'm glad we agree on this. I mean, you go into 2020, as you say, with Black Lives Matter, George Floyd. Um, does it feel like here we go again? Um, 2020 looks a lot like 1968. I mean, is that... From my perspective, it absolutely does. Does yeah. 68, 
2020 does feel like 1968. And it's interesting to me, you know, Matthew, that I was 18 years old when Dr. King was assassinated and Bobby yeah. Kennedy was assassinated. And probably because of my youth, the impact of that year hasn't hit me. It didn't hit me until years later. Yeah. But 2020 has really hit me. You know, I'm, I'm a much older human being, maybe mature to a level where the nuances and the complexities of, of life are so much more in my face and so real to me now that yeah. this, this, that this particular year, 2020, will resonate probably even more for me than 68 did. Because I was a young man then. I, I understood what was happening, but I don't think the, yeah. the impact of it has resonated like the, what's happened in 2020 has resonated with me. It's, 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 a, it's a very interesting perspective as someone who's definitely middle-aged, I uh, will attest. Yeah. Um, I mean, when you're, um, when you're 18, things are so black and white, aren't they? Exactly. And, and there's something good about that. There, it's good. I mean, I'm glad there's 18-year-olds out there who, who can feel that way. But then at the same time, when you get older, it's kind of like, well, things are never completely just so black and white, are they? That's exactly how you see life. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly how I saw life in 68. Things were pretty black and white to me, you know? Yeah. I always say the two, the three big emotional impacts that happened to me in the 60s was in November 22nd, 1963. I'm sitting in my junior high school classroom yeah. and my teacher comes in and says, school will be closed today because the president of the United States, John F. Kennedy, has just been shot in Dallas. Yeah. I, I couldn't believe that a president of the United States could be shot. I just yeah. was like, what? Yeah. And yeah. then two days after my birthday, April 4th, 1968, I'm sitting at home and the news comes on that Martin Luther King had just been shot in Memphis. <laughs> Again, I'm like flummoxed. And then three months later, you know, yeah. almost three months later, Bobby Kennedy is killed in California. I mean, I, I couldn't believe that this was happening in America. You know, but but somehow the impact of that it didn't have the same kind of resonance that this 2020 has had on me as a middle aged man with grandchildren and grown yeah. adult children and looking at the world in a more complex and nuanced way. It's it's also interesting because for someone who like me was born about the time, well, I was born 1967 for the record. Um, you know, the 60s always seemed like this time period that would you would never see anything like this again, kind of, yeah. you know, I know. <laughs> and then here we are in 2020 and it's just like every day, you never know what's going to come through. You and don't. You, and you, you never know anymore. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an amazing world we live in now. Every day in this news cycle, Matthew, something happens. You say, what? It's like over the weekend, you know, we're hearing about in America, we're hearing about the election. A runoff in Georgia between you know between the Republicans and the Democratic senators, senatorial candidates, yeah. and all of a sudden, this tape comes out of of of, of Trump talking to this the uh, state attorney, the state yeah. attorney in Georgia, and you're like, what? Yeah. And then yesterday, you're hearing about how two more senators, you know, have joined this going to be a part of the objection of the of, of confirming the electoral votes on Wednesday. It's like what? Mm -hmm. And the idea that the National Guard's going to come out in the streets of D.C. just in case. I, it's like, <laughs> you, you, you feel schizophrenic. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, um, our, you know, someone asked me about, about some book recommendations. And I was thinking back to even like um, Philip Roth, you know, the, uh, has a book on, um, what is it, the, the plot. One of the books that he wrote about the presidency and you got uh, like a Lindbergh becoming a president and things like that. And you, it seems fantastic at the time. And it's, uh, it is, it is fiction, but you know, <laughs> truth is stranger than uh, fiction. Truth, uh, truth uh, has reality. Fiction. Did, did you believe, listen, man, I didn't believe in 2007 when Obama was running for president that he would win. I completely agree with you. I, I, I had someone in 2006 so I was working for The Economist at the time. A young intern, American intern, came to me. And she goes, well, what about Obama? You know, because he'd had that speech at the, what was it, the 2004 Four. Yeah, convention. Uh, convention, which, you know, still to Not this day, right yeah. puts goosebumps on, you know, on my back. And uh, 
uh, hair stand up on my back because it was such an amazing speech. And then uh, she said, well, I said, there's no chance. No, there's no chance someone named Barack Hussein Obama can get, right. yeah, can get elected. And then, and then, and thank, you know, then he did, it, it, it did happen. And I, um, but, but then we got Matthew 2017, <laughs> Donald J. Trump. I, I mean, what, what? It is a, it is a strange world we live in. And, and he's, and, and he's even to last night in, in Georgia, man, he's saying he still won the election. Yeah. And he's saying that he's going to get vice president Pence to, um, he's, he's going to save the day on Wednesday when he uh, s- supposedly doesn't certify the results of the Electoral College or something. He, it's all, he cannot certify. All he's there to do is to monitor it. It's, it's a purely ceremonial role. I, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, the thing is, I've stopped thinking, well, there's, I mean, I will say I was one of those that were like, well, if Trump loses, he'll go. And not that he would go quietly, but it, we're not going to. No, I think uh, those who were saying... Look, I'm, I wouldn't be so strong as saying I thought there'd be a coup, but for those who say, look, it's, he, he's got a certain MO and he doesn't know how to operate otherwise, basically. And exactly. So he will not go gently into this good night. Man. No, he will not. You know, he, he, will, he will be a thorn in our side until, until you know, he passes away, quite honestly. That's that's quite possible because they're already talking about him coming back in 2024. He, he, he's never going to go away, man. He's going to, he's going to, he's going to, I mean, it's sort of like when he challenged Obama's citizenship. He, he, he was like a dog with a bone. Mm. He can't let go. He can't let go. The guy is so pathological, man. Well, well maybe we can get back. Let's go back to this uh we could talk about this forever, um, but uh, maybe we get back to this film. Um, and it, uh, it's not a spoiler alert. Uh, I, we don't don't want to go too much into the details of the film because I want people to come and and watch this as they should. It's a it's a great film. I really enjoyed it. Um, but you ha- you pose a question. You mentioned David Garrow, who, as you said, you worked closely with on uh, Eyes on the Prize, and uh, who uh, features prominently in this film. Um, And you posed a question to him that I thought was really interesting right at the end of the film. And I'm going to paraphrase it and and pose it to you, which is, what is your responsibility as a filmmaker when making a film about someone like MLK? Yeah, here's here's my answer. My responsibility is to try to tell a story that's complex and nuanced and not to whitewash it. You know, not to make a hagiography about Dr. King or anybody who I may admire or respect. Mm. I always want to be able to dig into the human being and see that they had their own particular moral, what I call human flaws. And so for me, the the responsibility I felt that I had in Ben Hadin, the producer, or that he also felt he had, was to tell a story, a complex, nuanced story about Dr. King and the things that he had to confront. He was not only dealing with being a leader of the civil rights movement, he was dealing with his own personal demons, his own, you know, his, 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 his liaisons with other women. He was dealing with the fact that at a certain point in his trajectory, he decided to come out against Vietnam and understanding the kind of yeah. pushback and backlash he would get from doing that, not only from the white community, but from within the black community. You know, the understanding that he wanted to try to understand that the notion for civil rights was also about economic rights. And that's why he felt he needed to have to create the Poor People's March. You know, the fact that, you know, he was a man who was constantly multitasking. You can see the weariness in his face as this film unfolds, as, as he's moving through the years, dealing with different things from going to Birmingham, going to Albany, Georgia, going to Selma, going to Chicago, you know, going to, you know, Oslo to get the Nobel Peace Prize, coming back to America, having to deal with J. Edgar Hoover, you know. I mean, this man had a very complicated life. Yeah. And I felt that we had the responsibility to show it. Now, does it make him look like the saint that everybody has sort of painted him to be? No, I just think it shows him as a human being, as yeah. much as we try to show Hoover as a human being, too. Yeah. And I well, think that's my responsibility as a filmmaker. And if I may say so myself, I think you do that extremely well, because Thank I you. think what comes out to me is that ultimately this, this film is about the complexity of human beings. I mean, yes, there's a story about MLK and J. Edgar Hoover, but, uh, 
And we do put our heroes on pedestals. And you've already mentioned JFK and things that we didn't know that people didn't know about at the time. Um, and um, maybe as we, and you've also alluded to is that there's we've completely separated people's personal character and life and character from what we think about them as or what happens to them as politicians. But maybe maybe that's gone too far to the other extreme. We need to understand that you can great things can be achieved by flawed people. Exactly. That's a great phrase, the way, that's the way you just said it. Great things can be accomplished by flawed people. And that's always been the trajectory. Yeah. It's never been like a person is one thing or the other. They're complicated. Yeah. I mean, if you go back in American history to George Washington, to yeah. Thomas Jefferson, to Abraham Lincoln, you know, up through the t- centuries, every one of these men in America that have been considered great American heroes yeah. were flawed human beings. Yeah. And we've wanted to make, and so all these myths, and it was like, if you think about George Washington, you have all these myths develop that to- Always, you know. always. It goes back to a, a John Ford film I watched that came out in 1948 called For the Patchy with yeah. Henry Fonda and John Wayne. And Henry Fonda was a, yeah. a, a you know, a, a crazed colonel who basically took his men to slaughter. And at the very end of the film, you know, when John Wayne has taken over his command, you know, he's being, he's being interviewed by the journalist. And, uh, and Ford did this with the man who shot Liberty Valance. And he says, when you print the legend or you print the real story, yeah. and a lot of times you print the legend, yeah. you know what the real story is, you know. Yeah. So, so how did you th- then go about telling this story? Because as you've already, I think you've, you've already made mention of this about what you look for now in terms of stories and films. This is, and for listeners, this isn't a biopic, it's, but it's, yeah. uh, it's a story with a clear protagonist and antagonist, as we've discussed, each with their fatal flaws and each with their own view of what America's meant to be. Exactly. You said it. <laughs> yeah. That was the charge. And that was the charge. And, 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 the, and the, when we did our first cut of the film, which was over two and a half hours, wow. the challenge was to make sure that we kept that trajectory going with the protagonist and the antagonist all the way through up to the assassination of Dr. King. And then with the epilogue, what does it all mean? You know? mm-hmm. And so we, we had put in a lot of stuff in the, in the two and a half hour version that looked at King's sort of trials and tribulations in Albany and Birmingham and even in Chicago. And mm-hmm. we felt that, you know, and we even did more on the Black Power movement with, with, the, with the FBI. But mm-hmm. we felt as we started to narrow it down, we had to sharpen the, the narrative. We had to focus it more to make sure that, you know, the two men who were at the center of the story, that their stories and what the context of what they were involved in comes through even more strongly. I mean, we even had a whole section that dealt with people that were part of the Communist Party, a group called the Solo Brothers, you know, who were connected to Stanley Levinson, and that was sort of, the, the, you know, set up J. Edgar Hoover wanting to really understand the arc of the Communist Party, his obsession mm-hmm. with the Communist Party, which we had to lose. I mean, so yeah. we really had to really sharpen the narrative, which is, which is really, you know, the, the part of all of us as filmmakers, we're always trying to figure out how to sharpen our narrative yeah. and telling our story. Which is, uh, I mean, uh, it's it's quite a challenge. As I as I find out, not in, not in this case, but uh, you know, in interviewing filmmakers, it's uh, it's always interesting too because they will sometimes uh, talk about things as if they were in the film, and then forgetting that those didn't necessarily make the final didn't, cut. Didn't make the cut. <laughs> but then, and then I've come to appreciate the fact that you have so many hours of a film and stuff in the can that wow. you must lose track of how much you know well you do you forget sometimes you forget the stuff you have in the can i mean it's <laughs> always fascinating about documentaries any kind of film sometimes when you have an opportunity to look at some footage that you didn't use or outtakes of material that you didn't use you'll say oh how come i didn't use that in the film oh i did but i took it out <laughs> <laughs> And then you, uh, interestingly, I thought uh, you keep the talking heads hidden throughout the film. Um, and uh, I, I imagine that was done, obviously it was done purposefully. Um, uh, maybe give us a little thoughts behind that. I mean, I, as someone I knew, I recognized Andrew Young's voice and you see him in the, in the archival, but we don't see him till the, the very end. Right. But that was that done on that was obviously done on purpose and for it what was, purpose? It was it was part of our initial aesthetic approach to telling this story. 
Ben and I both said that we felt that we wanted to have the story told by what you were seeing on the screen and have the people commenting off screen. And the film that had sort of influenced that trajectory for me was a film I had seen around 2011, 2012 called The Black Power Mixtape, mm. you know, where I think it was a, a Dutch filmmaker had, had all this fantastic archival footage about the Black Power movement and nobody who commented on it from Angela Davis to Harry Belafonte was on camera. They were all off camera. And so I felt we should try to we should try to do that. And I had also sort of done that. I had not also I had also done that with a film that I edited. It was one of the producers on about Frank Sinatra that Alice right. Gibney directed in 2015, mm. where we had had all this audio of Frank Sinatra, and it was just audio. So we decided to people that we were going to interview they would be all off camera. So we had done all these audio interviews with other people in Sinatra's orbit. They were only audio only. And if you watch a lot of the documentaries today, I mean, the Amy documentary, there's a new right. one out about John Belushi. They all take yeah. that same sort of aesthetic approach. There's one about Bruce Lee that's out called Be, Be, Be in Water or something. Yeah. You know, and it's all the same, it's the same approach. Nobody's on camera. They're just talking a voiceover. Yeah. We're actually having the Belushi people on um, recording uh, later this week. Um, oh, RJ. Tell RJ us hello. I will. I definitely will. Um, I mean, I think what, I mean, I won't take credit for this because I saw someone else said this, uh, but to, I think what it helps do is it really helps you, the, the viewer become fully immersed in the time. You don't have this sort of flashing back that and forth. That was the idea. That was the yeah. idea. Not to break it up with somebody coming on camera, but keep you immersed in the material and in yeah. the period. Exactly. Yeah. Now, um, my understanding is... Um, um, so David Garrow, the Pulitzer Prize winning historian, um, <laughs> who you've worked with is reassessing his, 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 I don't know what these things, I mean, reassessing his view of MLK in light of some of the stuff that he has seen. Um, the tapes may be released in 2027. 20, I mean, what do you think? And do you think they should be released? My answer to this, this last part of your question is yes, they should be released. And here's why. Now, some people could say, and Ben Hadeen and I had this discussion a few times, were we now doing what the FBI had been trying to do in so many years, years yep. ago? You know, were we undermining King's reputation? And I had to seriously think about it. I mean, you know, we're going to look at stuff that people don't really want to talk about. Are we doing, this, doing the same thing the FBI was doing? Now, my answer to that is no. I think that as filmmakers and as historians, as you determined you used about me, mm -hmm. we try to be much more thoughtful and even handed in terms of how you've been dealing with the rape allegations in the film. Yeah. Now, now I think in the release of the tapes, I think a few things could come to light. And it's, to me, it's not just the, the affairs he had with the women. Yeah. I think what can come to light is the fact that when he was in these rooms, hotel rooms in city after city, in Albany, Georgia, in Chicago, in Selma, there had to be people in those rooms with him, like Dorothy Cotton or Ralph Abernathy or Clarence right. Jones or Andy Young or James Bevel talking about strategies, talking about the strategies they needed to implement to go into these cities to break the back of segregation. So to me, that's fascinating. I think I'd be yeah. looking forward to hearing that if it exists. The other thing that I think you should, we also be, should be mindful of, that if you revered and loved Dr. King in the 60s and the 70s like I did, none of these things I'm gonna hear in the tapes I think are gonna change my sense of him. It'll just make me seem more as a more flawed human being. Yeah. Now, if you hated Dr. King or you despise what he was all about, this will just com confirm what you thought about him from the beginning. So, yeah. you know, it's an interesting thing about, you You know, you know this, you can hear one person say something and you can have, one person can believe it sounds one way, another person can believe it sounds another way. It's like Trump's speech last night in Georgia. Now, obviously there are people in that crowd who worship what he said. Now yeah. me, I found it horrific. That's what's so fascinating about the life. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a very good point, and I it does remind me of some of the t like you you uh, as someone who's I don't know have an interest in failed uh, Democratic presidential administrations, and so I've looked in a lot into LBJ and Jimmy Carter and play people like that. But there's a, you know, there's a lot of, do you think, do you think LBJ had a failed presidential administration? Well, I don't think so. Actually, that's the point. I don't think it was as it was failed. In fact, I think 
again, you would talk about flawed human beings. Um, flawed. He was an extremely flawed human being. <laughs> I, I'm from I'm from South Texas originally, so I grew up sort of. There was not not that there was any hagiography about LBJ, but he was uh, held up in a certain certain way. But uh, he couldn't. I mean, it's 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 almost Shakespearean the 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 tragedy that he found himself in in terms of not being able to that's express himself, himself away from Vietnam. Vietnam. Yeah. That, 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 that's what tarnished his reputation. Yeah. I mean, it's fascinating when you think back on these presidents, man, that I grew up with. Yeah. You know, in, in 1962, I thought, I thought JFK was the cat's pajamas. Yeah. You know, here he was with that beautiful wife and those beautiful kids and was yeah. Camelot. You say, wow. Yeah. Then in 60, from 64 to 60, 63, after his assassination in 68, you know, LBJ's Great Society, I thought, I was a part of that. Yeah. You know, as a young teenager, I was one of those kids who got money from the Great Society, the Hari yeah. Act, yeah. you know, and then Vietnam, and then Richard Nixon, man. They, this is what's so fascinating. I'm in 1970, when did, when did Nixon leave office, 74? 74. April I'm 74. In, I'm in Antigua in 1974 with a bunch of white high school kids building a community center in Antigua, the summer of 74. And one day on the news, we get the news that what? That the president of the United States is going to leave office because of Watergate. Yeah. I was, this is, this is amazing to me, man. I was so yeah. shamed of America. A shame, yeah. America. You know, I, I've, I've, I've grown, I've grown up with two pre a president being assassinated, a civil rights icon being assassinated, Bobby Kennedy, who might have been the next president of the United States, being yeah. assassinated, and then in '75, a president who has been dishonorably, you know, yeah. thrown out of the White House. You tell, I mean, you, you can't, I mean, you can't, you can't write these things, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the trajectory of American history is like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Which, in a way, makes, I mean, the 80s and 90s were just sort of this, except, I mean, in that regard, exceptional decades almost. They were kind of boring yeah. decades. Well, it, well, I don't remember it, Iran Contra, man. Well, there's around, there's all kinds of stuff going on, and there's <laughs> Berlin Wall Falls and stuff like that, which you never thought would happen. But in terms of like these sort of, I mean, these fast moving events, which, you know, 2020s had his, our heads spinning around every day. Uh, you know, you think about that arc from sort of Kennedy winning election to Nixon leaving the White House. That's all oh. within four, 14 years, you it's know? Amazing. It's, it's amazing history, man. You think about the history that's going to be re written about 2020. Think of the books and films and yeah. it's going to come out in the next 10, 12 years, man. Yeah. It's, wow, man. Well, you've, you got some ideas there. You think for uh, future projects? It must be. I always got something percolating in my head. Man. <laughs> what a time! What a time we're living in, man! I, yeah. I, I can't believe it. I, yeah. I, 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 you, you can't write a better script than this. Yeah. Well, you. I mean, that's a good point. You were a professor at NYU's Tisch uh, School of the Arts, among other right. things. Um, right. And uh, what do you think about the future of documentary filmmaking? Are you know are you optimistic? You must see what the next generation is uh, looks like in terms of filmmakers and where things are headed. I think that the the, the next decade of documentaries is alive and well. I'm in the academy now, uh, and every year we get on our academy queue over 200 films, yeah. all types of documentaries. I've watched about 20 of them. You know. In the past week, I've watched 20 of them. Yeah. And it's amazing the breadth of creativity that you've seen. I've seen two documentaries about Khashoggi, and I like them both. The Dissident Interesting. And Kingdom of Silence. I like them both. I watched the Belushi doc the other night. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that, you know, my generation of filmmakers have done some extraordinary moves. You yeah. know, it goes back to Michael Moore, really. Yeah. You know? And now I think this next generation of people are like, Shala Lynch and Geetha Gambier and, and Matthew Heineman are creating a new wave of interesting and fascinating documentaries. Now, I, we had uh, actually had uh, Stanley Nelson on uh, a few weeks ago, and I asked him this question about being a golden age of documentaries. What did he say? Uh, and well, he said it is for some. 
because he says someone like him, he says, for those who are established, you're getting, he's getting calls all the time to, to do a, a doc. But that he thinks it's still very difficult for those who aren't established, even, even for people who have one good doc under their belt, to right. still get uh, commissioned to do um, uh, documentaries. At least that's how he's seeing things. Was, I, I don't think he's wrong, but I think he's, and he's, and he's done this, and I do it too, is to mentor the next, yeah. the next wave of documentary filmmakers to, give, to help them get a foot up, a foot, their foot in the door, you know, and the ability to make their own, yeah. tell their own stories. He's not wrong. I mean, but that happens all the time. You know, there's a group yeah. of us who become established and we're the go-to people, yeah. but then we have to help, help try to make room for the next generation. That's always yeah. the way it's got to be. Yeah. And I think, I think it's, it's even like uh, pro sports uh, coaches or managers. Sure. People, you, always, they always, you always wonder, how does that guy get that job again when it's just because they want a f- safe pair of hands? They're not thinking exactly. in terms of that. And yeah. then, you got, then someone has the nerve and the, and the guts to take a chance on somebody new. Yeah. And that's how it's got to be. Yeah. But uh, what is, so what's next for you? Uh, I don't think you have any plans on retiring anytime soon. Uh, you got- no, not, not in the next 10 years, but after that, <laughs> it'll be all the way over. But uh, I have a film premiering on HBO in about a month called Black Arts in the Absence of Light. Okay. It looks at many of the 20th, 20th, 21st century wonderful artists and the history of Black artists in America from Romare Bearden to Faith Ringgold to present day artists like Jordan Castile and Amy Sherrill okay. and Henry Wiley. And okay. then I'm also finishing up a documentary that I've been working on, which is really my passion project, a documentary that's hopefully going to be televised on the Serious American Masters next year in 2022 about the renowned percussionist composer, Max Roach. Oh, wow. Okay. So I'm to get that done. And, um, and, you know, developing some other projects. Hopefully I'm not going to talk about it yet until I get the seal of approval. <laughs> well, I can't imagine you won't get the seal of approval, but uh, but best of luck with that. Um, well, I think we're coming to the uh, the end of our time together. Unfortunately, it's been a pleasure having you on. I really, really have enjoyed our our time, and thanks for making time for us. And um, uh, just to remind our listeners, we've been chatting with uh, Sam Pollard, director of MLK FBI. Uh, released on January 15th, and uh, just just look for it. You, it's being streamed uh, ac- across the globe, um, as far as we know. And to, yeah, just say thanks again for coming on, and also to give a shout out to This Is Distorted Studios here in Leeds, England. And remind our listeners to remember to like us and share us with your friends and family wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.